Welcome to Our Voices on the Yard, where Black artistic excellence meets everyday life. I'm your host, Denise Woods. Join me as we explore and celebrate the achievements of the Black artists that attended conservatories and fine arts programs from around the world, starting with my alma mater, the Juilliard School. Hi, this is Denise Woods, and this is Our Voices on the Yard. Welcome back to part two of this extraordinary interview with Richard Alston, pianist extraordinaire. He's vulnerable, he's open, he's passionate, he's smart, he's, he's woke. I think you'll enjoy this part. So if you haven't tuned into the first part, I think you need to tune into the first part and then come back and grab this one because Richard has a lot to say. Come on back. Enjoy. If you could go back and tell your younger self something, knowing what you know now, what would, <laughs> what would you tell your younger self, the younger artist? That was the younger artist who was very shy, who was called a sissy, who spent hours practicing you, during the day when kids were out. I, I have to be honest with you, from what people tell me, I wasn't shy. Okay. okay, but you know something, you, you ask a question that I've heard many people ask other people. Mm -hmm. And the thing is this, I, 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 I'm a very emotional guy, okay? Yes. The answer to that question is people had already said it to me. All the things that I would say to that young guy, yes. people were saying to me, already when that was that young guy yes I, I i see i heard it already and you listen they were saying it to me but you listen oh you oh well, the reason why i say oh like that yes was because when the audition for sylvia ravenoff was over yes after those three hours she told my father take him to Padelson's music store he needs to get this music we got in the elevator, my mother, my father, Ovid Lewis, who arranged the audition, my father was red as a beat. <laughs> Ovid, Ovid Lewis looked down at me and he said, this is a great, wonderful experience you're about to undertake. If she tells you to eat, you eat it. <laughs> now, now I was scared. My parents never cursed and they didn't say it, but they were there. And I thought my father was going to give me a beating, even though I didn't say it. <laughs> but I remember, and so you say, listen, I dared. The only time I didn't listen was the white peacock. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only, the only time. Okay. So, so if that's the only time, what? What did you have against this, not the music, cause you didn't play it, so you didn't know, but what did you have against the command to learn the white peacock? What, 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 what I had against it was the actual writing. I was playing Beethoven sonatas. I was playing Bach, Beethoven fugues. I was playing Mozart sonatas, right? Yeah. This, just the first measure. <laughs> What is that? <laughs> what is that? It's beautiful. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> because I there was no YouTube. Right. Okay. Later I did collect records. That was my that was my saving grace between 12 years old at 18 years old, I would go to the library and rent records, wow. not rent them, take them out. Mm -hmm. The Library of Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. Borrow. We would borrow from the library. Borrow. That's the word. Borrow. That's, That's the word. word. Borrow. Mm -hmm. borrow. Uh -huh. After my lessons, I would go to the Library of Lincoln Center and rent and, and not borrow, borrow records. And so th there was there was nothing for me to grasp onto. Yeah. There was, I mean, it was it was strange. It was strange. Yeah. And, and 
but it was it was lessened not in just the composer, but Mrs. Ravenoff also taught me something very special to listen to what was coming out of the piano. Now, that may sound strange because I wasn't deaf and I looked at her, but she said, are you making the sounds that should be made? Is your piano soft? Is it really soft? Mm. Okay. Are you singing the melody? Mm. Meaning, mm -hmm. are you bringing the melody out? Mm. So all of this in the white peacock, and then I had to go to the zoo after yes. I learned all, all the notes. Yeah, it, it still wasn't convincing. Yes. I had to because she told me in the music, like three pages in, this is when the peacock is now the male peacock is showing his feathers. So when you play this, understand. And the other thing was, she later gave me a postcard with the picture of a white peacock. See. Because that was the other thing. Mm -hmm. It was a special peacock. Mm -hmm. It was white. Mm -hmm. And that's the title of the piece. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. all, of, all of this was going on. All of this. I, 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 I want to go back to something you said very early on. Those two notes, when you played those two notes together, and you said something just came over you. Can you describe that? Of, of, of I can describe it because it still happens to me. Yes, that's um, what I'm getting to, because I'm sure it does. When, when, when I play, when I do my videos, yes. I develop, I develop a, a, a term called piano canto. There's bel canto. Mm -hmm. which the singers, as you know, yes. the, the style of music. Piano canto is when every note must match. That when you, oh, when you have a melody and the melody ascends, mm -hmm. if a singer sings those five notes, they may not make a crescendo, but each note is going to be a little stronger than the previous one. And then there's a term in vocal music, as you know, called matching tones. Sure. So that when you play a melody, if I play, for example, mm. that you have to shape the melody. Yes. And that the melody should be above the accompanying chords. It's not the easiest thing to do. I didn't play. I didn't do that. I did. When you have a, a word that has, has two syllables. One syllable is stressed, as you know, I'm preaching to the choir. But you see, this is what I, when I do a master class, I teach this, that if you have a, a word, sometimes, sometimes, the first syllable, okay, is a little stronger than the second. Right. And when singers sing that, those, that, that word, they, if they say, sometimes, sometimes I feel, the first syllable is going to get a little more. It's not sometimes, it's sometimes. As pianists, we should make the piano sing mm -hmm. like a singer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We should do the word she taught me, inflection. At the piano, Yes. We must inflect the notes as a singer would. How much of your Africanness do you bring to your work as an artist? <laughs> it's, I'm smiling because, first of all, I'm an African American, all right? And just as I said to you, this whole musical thing is in my blood. That's in my blood too. Now, what I do do is I recognize it when it's in the music. Ah. There's, a, 
there's a composition I play uh, called Troubled Water. And it's a wonderful piece. And Margaret Bonds wrote it. At one point in the you piece- You acknowledged, I do, I, I read in your bio, which we will, which our, our audience already knows, uh, that you were acknowledged by the Alumni Association for this piece. <laughs> I have to clap and thank God for that. That was one of the greatest honors I have ever received. Yes. To, to and, and, and the thing about it is the, the, the video they selected was by Margaret Bonds. It was the Troubled Waters. Yes. So to, to have it acknowledged, a black man playing a composition by a black woman yes. being acknowledged as alumni of, of, of my school. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I'll calm down, I'll calm down. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but to answer your question, when I was first introduced to the piece, I heard another pianist play it. And I knew right away I had to play it. And the reason I had to play it was because as brilliantly as she played it, I felt that there was something other than what she did that I had to find out. Wow. So when you and, say that I had to find out, meaning that I had to play it so that I could discover what it was. Yes. Yes. And what it was was this. It's based upon the spiritual, wait in the water, right? I knew that that was sung at my church for baptism. Yes. And I, I, later, I later found out that it was also a coded spiritual Absolutely. that when slaves heard it they knew that if they were going to seek freedom at some point they had to get into the water because the dogs would be chasing them right but if they got into the water they would lose the scent my conclusion was this margaret bond called it troubled water this is my con conclusion that she could have called it wade in the water transcription I feel this, that when that slave got into the water, as calm as the water was prior than getting in, it was no longer calm once they got in. All the pain, all the agony, all the misery got into that water with them. And at that point, the water was troubled. Mm. That's why I feel it's called troubled water. And that's mm. my feeling. That's your and if one, you ask a question about the African connection, Yes. And there's one piece, there's one section where it builds up and there's a, a, a measure of silence. And then you hear this. To me, that's the African drums. Mm. That's mm. the African drums. Mm. That's the, 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 the drums from the homeland. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, it's the, it's the music, the music that some, sometimes there are selections where you have a strong Africanism, I'll put it that way, mm -hmm. and other music where you may not, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But um, I always look beyond the black and white on the page. Gotcha. I always look beyond those, those notes. Yes. And I teach my students this. When I do a master class, I did a master class where I had a, a, a very, very talented Asian woman, young woman play for me. And she was a student at the Juilliard, but the, the master class wasn't at Juilliard. It was actually sponsored by the National Association of Negro Musicians. Mm -hmm. She played for me a composition by a Russian composer and it had several sections, but the first section was very sad. And she played it very beautifully. But then I said to her, what are you thinking about when you play this? And she <laughs> said, the notes. And I said, okay, all right, you know what this music means, the title means, right? She said, yes. Um, and she said what it meant. I said, well, let me ask you something. Before you came to the Juilliard School, where did you come from? I think she was Korean. And I said, so you left your homeland to come here. What was that like? How did your family feel about you coming here? She said, they were very sad. They were very unhappy. How did you feel, I asked her. She said, well, I was happy I was going to Julia, but I was very sad. I said, well, can you put that into the music? Do you remember your mother's face? 
the last time you saw her before you left? I said, close your eyes, play that opening and see your mother's face. Mm -hmm. And she did it and everybody applauded that was attending the master class. Mm -hmm. and, and my conclusion is teachers don't do this enough. One of the things I wanted to tell you something, and I know we're probably getting close to the end. I don't know what's happening at Juilliard now, but I'm gonna tell you something. There are not enough mentors in the college. You see, I retired, okay? I don't know if I told you that. I yeah. retired. Yes, I started officially as, yes, finally. But I, I mention it, I mention it because every student, when they came to the college, I sat down with them and I talked to them about what music meant to them, mm -hmm. what the next years were going to mean the next month as far as studying, mm -hmm. because this is what was done to me and for me. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes it has wonderful, wonderful results. It has had negative results. I, 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 I spoke to a young man who came in and we talked about it. We talked about it. And then I never saw him again. Someone who knew me ran into him on the street. They knew him. They said, didn't you have a, a meeting with Professor Austin? And he said, oh, yes. They said, what happened? Oh, he takes music too seriously. <laughs> Well, well, and, and I've had students come into me and I say, okay, uh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a singer. I said, oh, okay, I love singing. Oh, I, I love singing. I said, sing for me. What? You want me to sing for you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're a singer. You said, I didn't say it. You said you're a singer. Well, um. I haven't prepared, I said, you don't have to prepare anything, just sing. Right, you're a singer. Can I come back tomorrow or next week and sing? I said, just remember this, until you sing for me, don't tell anybody you're a singer. <laughs> <laughs> don't say to anyone you're a singer, unless you're ready to sing. Go ahead. I just have to say one thing Please. To, to, to give balance. My paternal great-grandfather and paternal great grandmother helped found that town. What? And the first Baptist church, yes. The first <laughs> the first Denise, Denise, the first Baptist church that I began playing in as a child, they founded that church. I just found this out recently. I just found this out recently. Gosh. This is my father's Gosh. grandparents. So I, I, you know, I'm going to read this again. My guest, my guest today is a native of East Orange, New Jersey. Richard Alston received his first lessons from mother, Dorothy Early. <laughs> I say mother, but it was Aunt yes. Dorothy Early that she allowed him to call her. And he was only eight years well, old. Well, let me say, mother is mother. Mother is correct because every Mother's Day, I would not just bring her a Mother's Day card. I would stop at Boston Market. I would bring her a complete dinner. What for Mother's Day? This yes, great. Let's so and and so he was not only taught to play the piano, but he was playing organ and piano for the First Baptist Church of Vauxhall, New Jersey. Tell yes. me a bit about that. Tell me a bit about Vauxhall, New Jersey again. Well, all I know is as a child, my parents were members of the church. My grandparents were members of the church. My grandmother, Mary Alston, became mother of the church um, in later years of her life. She was also the superintendent of Sunday school, which was later my, my father's sister-in-law became sister uh, uh, superintendent of Sunday school. I still have the little Sunday school hymn book that my grandmother, uh, 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 Big Mommy, we called her, Big yes. Mommy, gave me. I played for the Sunday school where she was directing the Sunday school. In, in Boston. In, in Boston. Baptist. Yes, in the church. 
This is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. He continued his studies with Sylvia Robinoff in New York. We, we, we talked about Sylvia Robinoff. And, yes, and yes. And there's one thing you can just sum it up. I just loved what she said about, you know, <laughs> there, there's just let, so let many me, things. Let, and let me say this. I think I mentioned earlier, she asked me that question. I was 12 years old. I sent you a copy of my CD that I made. And, and the thing about it, though, was when I was making the CD, she lived in Florida. And I would call her and play some of the music over the phone for her. But when the CD was completed, I gave her a copy. She wrote me. And the first thing she said was, Dear Richard, do you remember when you were 12 years old? I asked you, did you want to be a good piano player or a concert artist? You are a concert artist. Oh. I have that letter. Richard. I'm blessed. You. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for asking me, Denise. Thank you. Thank you. You received your bachelor's degree from Juilliard, the Juilliard School, and then you were later awarded the highly prestigious Maria Guerrera Judelson Scholarship in Piano to return for your master's degree. Now, yes. this is huge. Because I know in the drama division, they weren't just handing out <laughs> based on merit. Yes. They, you know, they there were scholarships based on need, but it was based on mm -hmm. merit. That's what this was. And this is huge, my dear. And congratulations. I never knew this. In reading your bio, I was blown away by all of these tidbits of information because I went to Juilliard and I know how highly coveted and highly respected these things are. And sometimes, you know, we want to just sort of keep them hidden. But that's why the nature of this, our voices on the yard, at the yard, because that's what we call the Juilliard School. And let me say one more thing about Juilliard. Yes. That um, you mentioned about standing on the shoulders, right? Yes. You might not consider standing on the shoulders, but my friends at Juilliard were actors, dancers, and singers. I stood on your shoulders. The reason you, the three of you, actors, are expressive emotionally. Yes. Because you have words and a storyline. Yeah. Sometimes dancers have a story. You see, musicians, we only have really the black and white on the page. Mm. Sometimes there's a story behind the piece, but mm. you all had personality. Mm. That was the thing. I related to it. Mm -hmm. I related to it. These are people. And we had an emotional intelligence. That's what we were learning. We were learning. Wow, I like that emotional intelligence that we I were, never heard that before yes that we were getting through words through through punctuation even which you know yes. you, you've got rests you've got you've got you know whole notes half notes and a dancer has dancing notation they put that that energy and that expression in their bodies we have language that we were able yes. to put it and 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 connect the emotion to and so that's the reason why you were you you were drawn toward us. And yes. we were drawn toward you. <laughs> we were. you 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 have drawn attention from the musical world, educators and college and university students, for bringing to light the great contributions to class of classical music by composers of African descent. You not only perform the exquisite works of these composers that remain to this day relatively unknown to the larger public, but you also delight audiences with your lectures and masterclasses on the colors of music. I love that. The colors of music, classically black composers of African descent. Can you tell me some of the composers that- Sure, like sure. The that? first is Chevalier de St. George, Joseph Boulange. I know, I know most. I know most people. Though, can you give me a little, just a little? Well, he lived during the he lived during the classical period, the period that's commonly associated with Mozart. He lived during that time. He was also the director. He was a marvelous fencer, and but he was also the director of an opera company that later became the Paris Opera. Woo! 
so he <laughs> he is one composer. Um, there is there is Margaret Bonds. Mm -hmm. There is Florence Price, whose works now are just coming to the forefront. R. Nathaniel Dead, who composed um, piano music, a lot of piano music, and arranged spirituals, and one composer that wanted to be a classical pianist, but because he loved playing the piano and he wrote music from the time he was a teenager. At his high school, he wrote three musicals for the high school students. Tell me who this composer was again, Richard, please. Billy Strayhorn. Billy Strayhorn was Duke Ellington's number one arranger. Yes. To the point where many compositions that Duke Ellington's band played, people thought that he wrote them. Billy, Stray Billy Strayhorn wrote Take the A Train. Yes. Why did he write it? Because at, when, when, when Duke Ellington told him to come and meet with him for the first time, Billy Strayhorn said, how do I get there? And Duke Ellington said, take the A Train. He wrote this composition. He thought it was no good. He threw it in the trash. A relative pulled it out of trash. I think you have something they told him. And that became it. But he wanted to be a concert pianist. The piece, the valse, is spelled V-A-L-S-E. He mm. loved Chopin. Mm. He loved Chopin. And so when he was 15 and he wrote this, he was thinking of Chopin. You I included it. You remind I me. Include, ah, well, <laughs> I would love to appear as him. He is, he is, I stand on his shoulders. Yes. I yes. stand on his shoulders. Yes. There's, because there's, you see. There's, there's more, wait, there's, 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 there's more. I just want to just continue because with all of your, your wonderful full career and life, not just your career, I want, I want to hear details. So, you know, I, I, I want to hear more about the Metropolitan Opera's revival of Porgy and Bess, <laughs> in which you brought an unforgettable sense of well-researched, now this is what I love, well-researched authenticity to the role of Jasbo Brown, the man after whom we think j the jazz genre is believed to be named. You repeat that portrayal of Jasper Brown in the historic production presented by the New Jersey State Opera at Symphony Hall in Newark, New Jersey. Jasper Brown, when Gershwin wrote the opera Porgy and Bess, yes, the opera does not begin with summertime. Come on the now. Opera, the opera begins with the Jasbo Brown blues. That's true. That how that's how it begins. Can you can Any you play opera? more? Can you play? That more? was it. <laughs> Many opera companies sometimes leave that out, but that's how it starts. Now, in the score, it says Jasbo Brown. It doesn't say Jasbo Brown blues pianist. It says his name, just like it says best and crown, okay, and yes. Porgy. Yes. And so the man who wrote the play, or the a Porgy, he also wrote, uh, uh, I guess you would call a, 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 a literature on this man, Jasbo Brown. Mm. And so, mm. so what happened was this, I was curious, I read that the, the, the uh, how would you could call it, um, possibly that when he played, he played with so much excitement that people would scream, more jazz, more jazz. And so that is the idea possibly of one of the beginnings of the term. Now, what I did with that was there were dancers, when I saw the production of another pianist playing it, there were dancers all around the piano. And I thought, wait a minute, if he is playing with such charismatic force, mm -hmm. he can't just sit there playing. And so I choreographed it. What do I mean? That some of the, uh, Carmen de Lavala, the great Carmen de Lavala was brought in as the choreographer. And I called her and I said, could I please attend your rehearsals? I wanna see what you're gonna have the dancers yeah. do. 
And she said, sure. And I was in the outside of the rehearsal hall and I was playing it. And one of the dancers walked out. She said, oh, I can move to that, the way you're playing it. And so I said to her, I said, listen, I saw a rehearsal where I was just watching. At one point, you took the pianist derby off the pianist and we're going around with it. I said, when I do it, leave my derby alone. Because what I had choreographed was that there was a couple of measures I only played with one hand. Mm -hmm. I took the derby off with the other hand and I twirled it in the air while the other left hand was playing. And I did what was called the booty dance. <laughs> <laughs> while I was playing because I couldn't just sit there and just and play and just play. No, yeah. I had to get into it. Yes. I had to get into it. Richard, what year was this? I was in the production at the Metropolitan Opera House. I think 91 oh. it was. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And and I I it that was one of the greatest times of my life because I love opera. Mm -hmm. I, I fell in love. I fell in love with opera. Excuse me. When I was about fifteen. Yes. And Same here. I, I listened. I listened to the broadcast from QXR. Yeah. And so here I was, in the Metropolitan Opera House. Uh, at one point, I was walking to the to the stage, and in, in a rehearsal room was Pavarotti rehearsing. Oh. One time I was leaving a performance, and Domingo was going in as I was leaving. I mean, ah. Oh! I know. I know. I've been so blessed. I know. Because these are, that was something that most pianists will never experience. It's true. You know, being on stage like that. And so, and act, so. And acting and dancing and having. Oh, yes. I had to. I had experience. to. Absolutely. I had to. I had to. Let's just go on. We just have, a, as a special guest artist with the New Jersey Symphony, you performed in a special concert in commemoration of the birth of William Grant Still. Can you let young folks know who that was? William Grant Still was the dean, or regarding the dean of African American composers. Yeah. Um, he has written symphonies. One of his symphonies is called the African American Symphony, if I remember correctly. Um, I play his work in my concert. I met his daughter, Judith Ann Still, and I met her at a lecture she was giving about her father. And I was so moved by the story she was telling. She told one story of how all of these great American composers were scheduled to take a picture yeah. and they were lining up to take the picture and word had gotten out that they were gonna stand in front of him so that he would not be seen in the picture. And what happened, a great composer, I don't know if it was Aaron Copeland, somebody grabbed him and made, made him stand next to him because they, they knew that, that they could not stand in front of, say, Aaron Copeland or another American composer. Mm -hmm. And that's how, and I was just moved. Yeah. I was just so moved by what she said. What's, it, what's, what's your favorite, if not favorite, what piece comes to mind that you could play? I play a piece called Summerland. Um, I thought I had the music. I, I will say to you and to your, uh, to our, our people oh, who are listening to this, that if they go to my YouTube channel, there is a video of me playing Summerland and most of these black composers. Absolutely. How do we find you, Richard? How do we find, are you, is, it, is it richardalston.com? Yes. yes, well, there's austinpianist.com. That's mm -hmm. my website. Um, there are videos of me there. Um, if you go to YouTube, um, be sure. Well, actually, if you just go Google Richard Austin piano or Richard Austin pianist, the reason in Australia there's a Richard Austin choreographer. Oh my! Yes, you've got to put the pianist in there because I and we met. Oh, nice! He, he brought. I, I listen. I always watch what's going on around. He brought his dance company to Montclair State University Come one on. year. Get out. I'm not kidding. He came to Montclair State funny. University and I bought a ticket. And before I got there early and I went to the box office and I said to them, 
I said, now I'm gonna tell you something, but don't laugh because I'm not, it's not a joke, it's true. My name is Richard Alston, <laughs> A-L-S-T-O-N. Just like the gentleman who's, who's, I said, is he involved in a rehearsal right now? Because he knows of me because if, if he's seen my videos that I've seen his. Absolutely. And I said, they were shocked. They were looking at me like with disbelief. They said, just wait right here. Just wait right here. And they went and I guess they told me, he brought his whole company out Richard. to meet the other Richard Austin. <laughs> and I'll send you the picture of us. He's like six five <laughs> and I'm only five four. <laughs> I have to send you the two Richard Austins. This is amazing. This is but amazing. I, have, I do have to say this. I have a six o'clock appointment. Yes, darling. We just we're finishing up. Um, okay. As a guest artist with the, you were a guest artist with the Harlem Chamber Music Players, the Harlem yes. music Players. You performed two separate concerts. Yes, with them. I, I wonderful, and I hope I can get back. And I love playing chamber music. Really? And on my YouTube channel, there are videos of me playing chamber music. Yes, this I is, love playing chamber music. What you see the pianist I admire. They did everything. Yes. I love working with singers. Yes. And I'll tell you something. Hmm. I, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but I learned of this at Juilliard. There, there, is, there are compositions, 19th century compositions for piano and actor. They're called drama scenes or something like that. Yes. And the whole purpose of them is that they would have a pianist they would play, play the piano part and the actor would do these monologues. Yes, yes, yes. Very, very sort of staged and, and, and you know, kind of archaic in their, in, their, in their staging and their emotional. I never saw one. I never saw, but the pianist wasn't playing an accompaniment. They were equal parties in oh, this. Oh, why? Oh, no, I don't, then I don't know this one. I don't know this style. There's, there's, there's a famous one, I have to write you uh, about an elephant. I can't think of the name of it, for children. And I'm not talking about this, I'm not talking about the carnival animals. This, yes. These actually have a script that is for the actor or the actress, or just the actor we say now, mm -hmm. to be politically correct. That's true. And, and, and I would, so one day, if I come to California or you come here, we have to go through one of these. This sounds wonderful. I would love to do it together. Maybe, maybe as we retire, this will be our next, our next. No, stage. no, we don't retire. No, it's the next stage. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Retire from this stage to the next one. <laughs> transition. That's it's not retire. It's a transition. How about I only that? say that because so many people have said to me, "Well, now that you retired, are you going to take it easy?" Is it musicians, actors, dancers? We don't retire. Don't. There is. I'm going to end with this because Carmen de Lavalade was the choreographer for Porgy and Bess, yes. and her, her husband was Jeffrey Holder. Of course. I read Jeffrey Holder's son was with him in his final moments. Jeffrey Holder was choreographing, his son said, on his deathbed. Mm. He was actually choreographing. Yeah. And yes. I will say this, there was a great pianist who died on the stage of Carnegie Hall playing the Greek piano concerto. I want, Mrs. Ravenel said, that's going with your boots on. I <laughs> want to go with my boots on. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Richard, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Thank you for being so open and, and vulnerable and authentic and, and allowing us to stand on your shoulders. My pleasure. I stand on yours. Thank you, sweetheart. And I don't mind toting me. I don't mind toting you along with me. Come on, let's do this. <laughs> yes, yes. All yes, right, darling. Yes. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you again. Bye, everybody. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. This was our voices on the yard. Yes, Austin. Our voices on the yard. Yes. Class of yes. '79. Yes. Bye, Richard. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye.